Welcome to our review to get you all ready to sit for the RHIA National Certification Exam. This week we're going to review Domain 1, so you will be ready and prepared to answer all of the questions related to data content, structure, and standards. Let's get started. The first thing, of course, you need to familiarize yourself with are the coding classification systems. ICD-10-CM, CPT, HCPCS Level 2, and ICD-10-PCS. Make sure you clearly understand the difference between ICD-10-CM and ICD-10-PCS. Remember, 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 if it's not documented, it didn't happen. And if it didn't happen, you cannot code it, you cannot report it. It just didn't happen. This is not only a motto that we use with regard to coding, it's also reflective of federal law. And speaking of the law, you know the patient record or the medical record is a legal document. It can be used as evidence. It is created in the normal course of business. And HIM professionals are the custodians of this record, of this very important legal document and everything that is included within it. Remember also that it is the legal property of the facility. The facility owns the record, but the patient does have rights regarding its use. There are several different formats that can be used to create a healthcare record. And you should, in your review, in your studying, Get familiar with the details and the differences between a longitudinal patient record, a source-oriented patient record, a problem-oriented patient record, and an integrated patient record. Also become familiar with the contents of the record. These are standardized contents that must be included in virtually every single documentation, regardless of the format, of an encounter between a healthcare professional and a patient. These are all important things that must be preserved for the continuity of care, as well as reimbursement and the revenue stream, and many, many, many other purposes. As the custodians of the patient record, we are responsible for ensuring that the record is kept as long as it needs to be kept and then, at the time, properly destroyed and the destruction must be documented. These are rules and regulations that are guided by both federal and state laws as well as TJC, the Joint Commission, CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, as well as many others. You need to understand the rules and regulations regarding record completion. Delinquent records that are not completed within the specific time frame are a danger not only to the patient, but to your facility. And guess what? We're in charge of that. We in the Health Information, Health Informatics Management Department are responsible to ensure that these records are completed within their timeframes. We do not complete them. That is against the law. It is our responsibility to get them completed by the attending physician or the appropriate provider. CMS mandates that within 30 days of discharge, these records must be complete. Sometimes there are closer um, requirements, such as operative reports are required to be dictated or documented immediately after the procedure. 
Some other aspects can be done within 14 days of discharge. You must know when, where, who, what, and why. Record organization. Now, th certainly this and the next slide or so are going to cover the proper filing and organizational methodology aligned with paper patient records. But we are still, as a country, transitioning from paper to not plastic, to technology, to electronic. So therefore, you are still required to have this knowledge about serial numbering, unit numbering, and the combo hybrid serial unit numbering. You need to understand about filing systems, whether it's going to be straight numeric or terminal digit. These are all things that you must know. There's a chance you will have a question about it on the exam. And you do not want to be given away any points. SNOMED is a language. Well, maybe it's kind of more like a dictionary. SNOMED stands for Systematized Nomenclature of Medicine Clinical Terms, and it is a comprehensive standardization of clinical terminology designed because we are now a world as one, and because we seek to be interoperable, we need to be interoperable with our patient records, uh, interoperability refers to the technical transmission of information from one computer to another. But if the two systems don't speak the same language, it doesn't do you any good to be able to exchange files. Therefore, we have SNOMED CD. Learn about it, understand what it is, and what its purpose is. And, of course, in the world of technology, we have databases. And this is also part of our responsibility to create databases and to understand their components and the way they work. Understand what data is and how it differs from information. Understand what a database is, a data dictionary, and, of course, data mapping. So data mapping is linking between a target and a source for a given purpose. Let's investigate that a little further. The target is the patient data, and a source might be a lab test and its results, or it might be the radiologist report after reading an MRI or something like that. These pieces of information all have to unify in the patient's electronic health record. So therefore, we have the target, which is the vessel. This is, this is the main thing. Or if you want to think about it in old-fashioned terms, and I'm smiling because it's not quite old-fashioned yet, but think about a manila file folder, okay? And the patient data is the patient record is that manila file folder, and we're going to get the lab results, and we're going to put that piece of paper in that file folder. So the lab results are the source, and the target of where it's being placed is the patient data file. We also are responsible not only for collecting the data, but for storing the data and keeping it safe and secure. So you must understand the differences between a data repository, a data warehouse, and a data mart. Processing of information is done virtually always now, electronically. So you need to understand the difference between online transaction processing and online analytic processing. OLTP, the, transi the transition or transaction, is something like hitting that button and submitting a claim to a third-party payer. And that will be recorded in the OLTP. 
the online analytic processing, the OLAP, will be a database that will record the date, the time, and all of the details regarding all of the transactions. As we look at creating and managing and storing and keeping secure all of these databases, we need to understand what the responsibility of database management is. And that basically is <laughs> to manage a database. I know it's silly, right? But if I didn't say it, you might think it was something else. No, this has to do with the ability and the authority and the responsibility to create a database, to modify that database, to delete a database, and to view a database. That's all us, HIM department at your service. Now, it's also important that you know what a data model is. And this is essentially the ideal, the representation of exactly what the database that's to be created will need to do. How will it need to function? What type of information will it contain? From where will it gather its information? Who will enter information? Who will see information? Who will analyze information? Now, as we look at keeping information secure, you will learn about confidentiality, integrity, and accessibility and availability. Now, in order to make sure that we are protecting the data, we must make sure that all of the information entered is accurate. And in order to do that, we have to understand that there are human beings involved. And sometimes that's a problem. No, I mean, you know, we're all human. And to err is human. We all make mistakes. We've all been known to hit the wrong key at some time. So what we have to do as the HIM professionals is to do everything possible within our power to put controls in place to make sure we are guiding the hand that that feeds us the data. So learn about what access control is, what concurrency control is, and of course, integrity control. And integrity control is something, all of these things are something that we do have the authority and responsibility and and the capabilities of doing. So when we look at integrity control, these are controls that will help us to prevent an error in being made and to recognize an error as quickly as possible. How can we do that? One thing is by determining the type of field into which data will be entered. And we have several types of fields represented by this screen capture that you're seeing on your screen now. The first field, name of insurance company, you'll notice that little down arrow on the right side of the field. And by now you should come to know this as a Dropbox. Dropboxes give us great control over the integrity of entries because the information is already entered. You just have to click on the right one. Okay, I know that in and of itself has a problem, but at least we're not going to worry about people misspelling, not putting a space where we want a space, not putting a slash where we want a slash. So we have this ability to happen. We have this control and we can use it. And this way, every entry is going to be essentially correct. The next two fields we have are the name fields. And in this case, we can take control over the entry in a less specific manner, not by providing a control where the information is already there, because that would be impossible. But we can put a control in that says only letters of the alphabet can be entered in these fields. Whereas we can look at the next field that's going to be the insurance company group number and we may find that with the third party payers we're working with, these are always numbers. Or you may find this like with a phone number where it's always going to be numbers we can 
um, limit access into this field of only a numeric value. So that will cut down on errors of somebody accidentally putting the phone number where the name should be or putting the name where the phone number should be or the policy number. You can see here in this screen capture of that drop down menu how all of the details of the names of these insurance companies have already been entered. So all the user or the person required to enter the information, all they have to do is use their mouse to click on the correct one. And hopefully if they misclick, they will fix it before they enter it. Okay, now we also talked about databases being connected. Remember the conversation we had a little while ago about target and source. And one thing about database relationships is we want to have all of the data structured in manageable ways. And you can imagine if you had one database to have absolutely everything regarding a patient in a hospital and every patient in that hospital, how incredibly huge this database would be. So instead, we're going to chunkify. We're going to break it down into smaller databases. So where we have one database that just has the patient's information, demographic information, and then we might have another database that's going to only have basic information about a patient encounter. And then we might have another database of, of, uh, the medication, the pharmacy inventory, and another database about patient administered medications. So then you can see that we have all of these individualized databases that are going to contain very specific pieces of information. However, in order for us really to do a good job of managing this data and being able to analyze it so we can get some good use from it, we need these individualized databases to talk to each other. So we're going to use something called the primary key and a foreign key. And you'll notice that the primary key in the patient's database here is bolded is the medical record number. And that is always going to be a unique piece of information. That's why we have medical record numbers, because there are people with the same last names, people with the same first name, people with the same birth date, people, of course, with the same gender. So therefore, we need to have something that's going to make each patient, patient absolutely individual, and then we can use that to, as a connecting device between this patient's primary record and anything else that is other databases that relates to this particular patient. Now, when we look at a database relationship, there could be a one-to-one. -one. When we look and say, okay, databases, we're looking at this patient. Who is this primary care? Who is this patient's primary care physician? This is going to be a one to one because we're asking about one sim single patient, and that patient can only have one primary care physician. So that's what we call a one to one relationship. And that is identified as a O colon O. Then you might have a one to many relationship. So we might say database. Give us a, the names of all of the patients whose primary care physician is Dr. Cyrus Jones. In that case, we have a one-to-many relationship. We're asking about one physician, and we're asking about many, many patients. So that's going to be a one-to-many relationship, signified by O with a colon and then the letter M for many. All right. And then we have many to many relationships, M colon M, where we're going to have multiple entries on both sides of this relationship. So we may say we want all patients who had all of their lab tests in the last year. So we have many, many patients and many, many lab tests. 
And that gives us that many-to-many relationship. In all cases, we need to have that primary key, remember I mentioned it before, as well as um, a foreign key. And so the primary key, remember, I mentioned is going to be a unique something that is identifiable in that table that has that information about the patient. And that usually is the medical record number. It must be a number that has no possibility of repetition. Okay. Now in the olden days, we used to use the patient's social security number. We do not do that anymore because of identity theft and medical identity theft. So it must be a unique number that no one, no one, no one else can have. So nowadays, we usually can have our system in the hospital or even a physician's office. The system will assign a number and the system can keep track of what the next number in the sequence is to make sure that there are no duplications. The foreign key is going to be this primary key listed in another table. So so we can cross-reference the information. So if you remember that I said, well, what if we wanted to do one patient and who is this patient's primary care provider? Then we're going to look at the primary key for the patient and the patient's primary key is going to be listed as a foreign key in the physician's patient roster because the physician would have his or her own primary key, okay? So this enables us to pull information like, like, to gather and assess information. Let's look at an example. Okay, so here we have, again, that same patient uh, table that has the unique medical record number. So that's the primary key in the patient database, along with the patient's last name, first name, middle initial, birth date, gender, and their primary care physician's name. Then we're going to look at another table that's the pharmacy inventory. And the pharmacy's responsibility in their database is going to be tracking all of the medications that they keep in inventory in the pharmacy. So that primary key is going to be the medication ID that cannot be duplicated, along with the generic name of the medication, the trade name of the medication, the normal dosage, and the route of, inf of administration. So we have two tables here that are separate, but all within our hospital, okay? Now let's take a look at the way we're going to put this together because what we're going to put together is an administration log or a medication log that is going to identify every time a medication leaves the pharmacy and has to be given to a patient. So we have the primary key for the patient to whom the medication was administered and the primary key from the pharmacy administration for the medication. This connects them both along with the date of the administration, the time of the administration, the dosage that was administered, and if it's an ongoing, like an IV or something, a stop date. So you can see here how we can pull this information and connect, create re relationships between the patient and the pharmacy, just like there is in real life. So the electronic health record, EHR, is essentially clinical database applications all working together. It has tables and subtables organized around a medical record theory or concept, just like we used to do in paper with that manila folder. Okay, so we have the laboratory work, we have diagnoses, we have medications, we have demographics, we have referrals, we have procedures, we have all kinds of stuff, all individualized and connected at the same time. Let's look at a graphic. 
Oh, wow, there's a lot of stuff on this. Okay, but you can take your time and look at it. And you can see here on the left-hand side, we start with our source system. So it might be a claim, it might be enrollment, it might be who the provider is, it might be financial information, it might be reference data, or it might be outside sources like an independent imaging facility. And all of that data goes through a data acquisition engine and feeds into the integrated data storage where we have the clinical analysis, the provider, the group or individual consumer, the product, the financial information, which might then feed into other systems. But we're going to continue going right toward the right. And now we're going to populate the data mart that is then going to contain the various pieces of information because remember a data mart is like a store in the mall okay the data warehouse has little stores the data mart so you're going to have the data mart of clinical information data mart of operational data and then of course your financial and your other data and then that all can feed into analytics in which case we can then analyze the data either alone or in combination to gather the information, the details, the knowledge that we need to obtain and determine to make better decisions for our facility, for our patients. So the last thing I want to cover in this topic are the standards. And this is essentially something you should already know, and that's the difference between qualitative information and quantitative information. Very important. Okay, this starts our journey. Finishing up domain one, cover it. Read it, read about it in your textbook, and of course, let's discuss it in the RHIA exam prep discussion forum so we can talk things out, make sure you understand, and you're ready to pass this class. Oops, pass this exam. <laughs>